I'm just going to tell you a little more about Nick Spark, our speaker tonight. Um, first of all, he has a fabulous name to begin with. Um, but Nick Spark is a Los Angeles-based writer, documentary filmmaker, researcher, and producer of Nick Spark Productions. Um, he got his MFA graduate degree from the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Um, he began his work uh, working in advertising, but subsequently worked into the, in the film industry um, on both, uh, te in both television and film, uh, ranging from Dawson's Creek to Arnold Schwarzenegger's The Sixth Day. Um, more recently, uh, he produced and wrote the documentary The Legend of Poncho Barnes, which profiles gender-bending pilot Florence Poncho Barnes, a forgotten rival of Amelia Earhart's, uh, which I'd be interested in seeing. Um, Nick Spark is an accomplished writer of nonfiction and history and uh, is the associate editor of Wings and Air Power magazines. He's appeared in PBS History Detectives. I'm guessing a few of you have seen that program before. Um, and he served as a consultant on a number of documentary and nonfiction films. Um, in addition to all of this, he's also head of Periscope Films, which he'll be discussing tonight. Um, Periscope Films, which preserves and provides stock footage of 16 millimeter films, what started out as 16 millimeter military training films, but has expanded to other types of films as well. Um, and he provides the stock footage to uh, numerous uh, cable outlets and streaming services, including Disney, BBC, The History Channel, Discovery, and PBS. Uh, please welcome Nick Spark. Thank you. And the reason I, I ended up here, actually, is because of um, a Mark Morris, who um, happened to come to me with a uh, film that he wanted to scan. We have our props here from Mark. This, this, is, this is one of the films he wanted me to scan. I don't know if you can see this, but this is, this is what can happen to uh, films that are neglected or that, uh, in some cases, get uh, exposed to moisture or heat, or it could just be that when they were processed originally, they weren't, uh, they didn't go through the whole developing process that well. Like for instance, the developer was left on them too long. Something happened to them. Anyway, th this one you can see is a complete brick. But uh, Mark actually did bring me a couple films which we did successfully scan, which were not in this condition. <laughs> and um, I didn't bring any examples of them today, but um, he can tell you about that. But anyway, what I was starting to say is I went to USC, and as it happened, I was in sort of the last generation of students who got to touch celluloid. You know, right around 1990, thereabouts, the school acquired this machine called an Avid, which was the very first digital editing machine, and they had one called the Lightworks, which you might have heard of. And this was the very, you know, beginning of the era of everything moving from being shot on film to being shot on videotape. And I mean, that, that had been going on for, you know, since the 70s, but now it was really moving to videotape and, and bits and bytes and the digital realm. And so there was this big transformation happening. And, um, you know, I spent a semester at USC working on a little 16 millimeter film that I think was about five minutes long. And um, you know, we had to shoot it and then the film would get processed and we would edit the positive prints that we got and then we would send those to a negative cutter and we would get a cut negative which we'd send to a laboratory and then we'd finally get to see the finished film. It's a lot of steps, really time consuming and by the time I was graduating, the students who were coming in were shooting on a digital video camera and uh, they were putting it into this Avid and they were editing it and they could, anyway, they could have a product in a day. And this is the big transformation that's, you know, we're all enjoying the benefits of this. We all have in our, you know, our telephone here, we have the technology to basically run a TV station. I mean, we are running TV stations, right? And so this is this you know, enormous tipping point moment that I happened to arrive at USC in the middle of. And I think because I was handling film, and I, and I loved handling film, and just the physicality of it, and, 
and, and all the things you had to do to kind of make it work, the crazy things you had to learn, um, you know, I, I gravitated towards it and I was interested in it and I kind of tracked what was happening. And um, anyway, I got out of school and I decided I wanted to make documentary films. And let me get back to my laptop here. And, um, you know, I, I got this idea to make, I wanted to make a historical film about something obscure that, that wasn't a story that had already been told before. Um, because as, as somebody reads a lot of history, like the last thing I want to do is, is regurgitate a story that everybody already knows. And um, so I picked a pretty obscure topic, as it turned out. You know, I, I met a man who had a PhD who had just written a book about the US Navy's efforts to put nuclear missiles on board submarines. And his book was about you know, this effort and, and the fact that once nuclear missiles were put aboard submarines, it changed the mathematical equation of the Cold War. It meant that um, uh, the Soviets could no longer really effectively do a first strike on the United States that there would be a retaliatory strike. So this is a very important moment in the Cold War because it, it, it sort of stabilized the Cold War. And this PhD had written not about the Polaris submarines, which I think probably this comes to mind when you hear this, or the Trident submarines. He wrote about something called the Regulus submarines, which was a, um, it, it was the very first attempt to do this, and these were actually air-breathing missiles that you would have to push out on the deck of a surface submarine and launch like a small airplane and do your attack. And anyway, I thought this is really interesting. I've never heard of this story. It's a really you know, captivating history, so let's try and tell it. Well, I didn't realize how challenging it would be to do something about something that obscure. And I'm going to show you the trailer that I did, and then I'll talk about that a little bit. But this is the trailer that we did for this documentary. It's about two minutes long. In 1953, the submarine USS Tunney surfaced off the California coast to perform a top secret mission to become the first submarine to launch a nuclear missile. The missile was called the Regulus gave the submarine the ability to deliver a nuclear warhead to a target hundreds of miles away. The regular submarines and their nuclear missiles would be deployed off the Pacific coast of the Soviet Union during some of the most volatile years of the Cold War. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. The Cold War was a real war. We felt that at any minute we might be called upon to do what we were supposed to do. The first warheads in the world that were, that were going to go off in mutual nuclear exchange was a Regulus warhead. Today, submarines provide the backbone of the United States nuclear deterrent. But before Trident, before Polaris, the Regulus program, now largely forgotten, started it all. In 1945, the idea of submarines launching missiles seemed impossible. But because of the vision of a few Navy officers, weapon designers, and the submariners who served on the first deterrent patrols, the Regulus program was a breakthrough that changed the face of the U.S. Navy and stabilized the Cold War. All right, who knows who that narrator is? <laughs> it's Roy Scheider. Come on, this is from Jaws. It's a guy from Jaws. Okay, so, anyway, when you go back and look at this, there's a lot of different stock footage in this uh, segment I just showed you. 
Now, what you might not realize is, like I said, this is a very obscure weapon system development. And when we went to the National Archives and tried to find footage of this, there was basically nothing. No, they had nothing. And I thought, my God, there, there's no way to make this movie. And you know, I talked to the historian. He'd written a whole book about this. He said, well, I don't know. Maybe if you go up to Point Magoo, where they were developing this thing, maybe they have something. And I actually talked my way into their film archive, which they had floor to ceiling films of all these programs for 50 years they had been running there. And they started putting them up on a machine and we started watching these films and um, like uh, this, this shot, uh, let's see, right here, this is, one, this is one of the films I got from them. We got about, we did that for about a day and, and at one point they pulled out a film uh, that showed this missile where they pulled the missile apart and you could see the warhead and they guy that was showing them to me said, excuse me, but do you have, um, you have clearance, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said no, and I was sent back in. <laughs> but anyway, all this goes to show that um, it was really, really, really challenging to find footage for this film. And some of it, yeah, we were able to find. Like, I got this from the U.S. Navy. They were very happy to give that to me. This came from a friend of mine who um, makes atomic bomb movies. <laughs> um, this shot, for instance, we found, it turned out, the historian said, I think that the company that made this missile system still has some film. So we went and we scanned all of that film, and that was great, but we still had all these huge gaps, and it turned out, I was interviewing these submarine captains and veterans, and one of them said to me, um, you know, I have a pension and everything, and I'm not really supposed to do this, but way back in the day when I was the commander of the submarine, we sort of brought on our eight millimeter film cameras and we shot home movies on the submarine. Would you like them? And then another one of them said, you know, back when I was captain of the submarine, uh, they made this little promo movie for these submarines, and we would show it, you know, in the dining area of the submarine when we get bored. We, you know, when we were watching other movies, we put it up, and when we had guests who would come aboard, we'd show it to them. I still have it. So anyway, slowly but surely, we kind of patched together enough content to make this film happen. And it stuck in my mind about uh, the home movies, because those turned out to be critical. Like this shot. And their nuclear this, missiles would. I mean, that is a shot of this. And this uh, sister of this submarine is in New York Harbor, by the way, if you want to go see it. And you can see this whole movie on Amazon Prime still to this day. But the, the point is that like this shot, which was like one of the best shots of this missile getting launched and everything, it doesn't exist in the National Archives. It existed in some guy's home in a box that he put away you know, under his bed. So that stuck with me. And also the other thing that stuck with me was all this film footage at Point Magoo. Because uh, this other critical moment happened, which was that I was making another film, which was mentioned about a woman pilot named Florence Lowe Barnes, who was better known as Poncho, Poncho Barnes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the famous quote with Amelia Earhart is, uh, you know, I like to fly for the fun of it. And uh, Poncho said, flying makes me feel like a sex maniac in a whorehouse with a stack of $100 bills. <laughs> so it was kind of the <laughs> other side of the spectrum. But anyway, we're making that film and we were up at Edwards Air Force Base, and I needed stock footage of Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier because Poncho later in life owned a bar right next to Edwards and hosted all these famous pilots. So this was really important, and they brought out a videotape that they had that they would give to any network that wanted footage of this, and it looked terrible. The footage looked terrible on there. And I said, well, where is the motion picture film? Because I would like to scan the film. And they said, oh, we actually don't have that anymore. 
See, because we, uh, we, some commander decided that all the networks want stuff on videotape and we didn't have room for all these videotapes and all these films. And so some of it we sent back to the National Archives or the Library of Congress. And some of it we threw out. And this, it turned out, this was something that, that may have been the first time I ever heard of it, but sometime around like the early 2000s, this became like an avalanche because there were all these, you know, like for instance, I attended the University of Arizona as an undergrad. They had an enormous library of 16 millimeter films. And, you know, after a certain number of years when nobody was accessing them, nobody was looking at them, nobody was borrowing them anymore to show them in classrooms because they were showing them on DVD or VHS. And uh, I know there's some people under the age of 30 in the room, so VHS is like this tape. Anyway. Uh, but the University of Arizona, at one point a friend of mine called me, he said, hey, um, you know, I'm just at this auction for the University of Arizona, they're selling these floor-to-ceiling pallets of film. Hmm. And at the time, it didn't really mean that much to me. Um, but subsequently, believe it or not, I bought films from that collection, because it turns out that in addition to all these wonderful uh, educational films and, and feature films and other things, there were actually films that were specifically made for the university that are really, really interesting. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. so. Like to have a film of Tucson from the 50s that the university made is really neat and they should never have gotten rid of it. And I'm sure eventually we'll get it back to them. But the point of all this is, is there was this tipping point where all these institutions decided we don't have space for this and no one's using this and we need to use this space for something else. And it, it, it actually, apparently, what, what happened with the military especially was the government said essentially what these people at Edwards Air Force Base said, which is this stuff is obsolescent. It has no value to us in the current moment. And it's, rep, it's re repetitious of what's stored in the, the National Archives. So, send whatever isn't in the National Archives to the National Archives or get rid of it. And the mechanism by which they set up to send things to the National Archives didn't exist. So I found out that the US Navy in San Diego was basically, they had this huge library of films and they were, they were gonna dump them. They were dumping them. The same with March Air Force Base, which was this thing called the Defense Visual Information Center. There was a guy who worked there named Wayne Weiss, who the day that they said, we're gonna throw away all the 16 millimeter films, he quit his job, he rented like a Frohoff semi-tractor trailer and loaded the entire thing with films and preserved them all. So that stuff started happening. I started doing it too. I got, I got kind of suckered in because first of all, I started getting, I had some of these submarine films and you're gonna see where the term periscope film comes from, is that w the first group of films that we grabbed were these submarine films made by the Navy that I used for my movie. And then, um, you know, it turned out some of them were kind of obscure and interesting enough that my friend Douglas Weiner and I started putting them out on DVD, although actually the first things we ever did were on some uh, even more obscure format called video, disc, which was like a CD that you could burn a really low res movie to. And, and anyway, we started buying films and we bought a, what was called a telecine machine to convert them to digital and we started putting them out. And it was kind of like this little side thing that we were doing. Hi, this is Nick from Periscope Film, and we don't usually do live video, but today is kind of a special day. This is 
16 millimeter and 8 millimeter film that we're rescuing actually. This is a very large collection that belonged to a, a friend of mine who's become rather elderly and can't take care of it anymore. Many, many boxes here. This is a German uh, 16 millimeter film probably from the 1940s. Um, is the break breakdown of the 1930s. We're going to be spending the coming months assessing all these things, hopefully share some of our discoveries of what's in here. So this is about uh, midway through our day here. We are moving all these films into a storage locker. It's going to be quite a bit of work, but uh, kind of looking forward to seeing what kind of rarities we find. And we know there's a lot of unique movies in here, so it's kind of exciting, but also a little overwhelming. Welcome, uh, I'm Doug Wiener and this is my business partner, Nick Spark, and we own and operate the premier stock footage company, Periscope Film. But we actually take these films and we transfer them to the HD and 4K so we can make them available for the public. And we like to say about our business that we preserve history one film at a time. In this particular case here, we're gonna preserve a lot of history as you can see. for the last week essentially is sorting through this gigantic collection of 16 millimeter and 8 millimeter home movies and the first thing we're doing is separating out the 8 millimeter from the 16 millimeter and then the further separation that we're doing is trying to take the home movies and separate them from the commercially made movies well it's not a feature but this bold journey is a um, television show from 1957 so this would go in the rack with the commercial films. The reason I guess it's all taped together, it's probably three separate episodes of that show. Very rare show, by the way, from uh, early era television. So I'm excited to see those. You know, we have 27 years of experience here, knowing how to handle all the film, knowing what has to be done to it, knowing what films uh, just physically, you know, over history have degraded to such a point you, they're not worth saving, and which ones that we can rescue. Every day as we open these boxes, there are surprises. And one of the surprises that we don't like to see is actually its, it's smell. It's, there will be an intense vinegar odor sometimes coming from some of these films. And what that means is the film is starting to deteriorate. Um, it's acetic acid. And that's a chemical process that robs the world uh, of a lot of films. Yeah, you can see, I mean, this is emitting extremely heavy odors and it's, it's hexagoning. And uh, it's a goner. We'll never get to see that one again. Oof. See, it's where we got, it's kind of sad, you know. Here's this someone's memory. It's kind of, it's it's turned this hexagon pattern, not just this outside, but it's it's rock solid. So, you know, is this savable? Those are the films that we will try to scan first. So that's a little bit of the method to the madness here today. You know, we're saving them as fast as we can. And we, you know, we want to save them all and then we, have to pick and choose too. Right here where we are, the old MGM studio is over that way. The old Hal Roach studio is over that way. By, I'm talking like five blocks from here. And there's always been Hollywood and then there was the other Hollywood. There were companies making industrial films, educational films. Those were always the second class films. The things you saw in your classroom or that were put out by Ford Motor Company. Those kind of films were viewed as ephemeral films. They were films that were made to last like two years and then they throw them away or put them on a shelf. You never see them again. And what we have really harnessed is finding those films, saving those films, scanning those films, showing those films to the world because suddenly you see histories of things that companies created that were really important to the American story in the 20th century but you know there's been no way to see those things until we put them up there. I love this. Glacier National Park brought to you by the Great Northern Railway Company. Yeah. So that's going to be some probably very beautiful national footage. Films. Yeah. This is a monojet injection film. So this is a film I'm guessing is like produced by a jet engine company. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that term means, but what if it's early fuel injection? Yep, could be a car company. Boy, this is looking like a mystery to me. So this is, a, you know, this is the kind of thing that I love to see, because if you ever heard of this system, 
the monojack system, but it looks like maybe it's about syringes. Oops, Oops. and the film broke. This this is, is, well, this is what we see. See, somebody, somebody used a piece of scotch tape to make a splice, which is not what you want to do. So this is what we end up doing. We have to repair these films to make them, you know, scannable. So this is the next step in the process. We've taken some of the films from that gigantic collection we've been processing and we've brought them back, scanned it into HD and 4K. Assisting me with this is Esteban. Say hi Esteban. Hello. He's um, setting up the scan station, which is a scanner we use to, to look at all of our content and, and to scan it. So you can see that the footage is reddish. The blue dye uh, tended to fade with film stocks that were made in the, in the 60s and 70s called Eastman Color. They tend to lose the blue. So what Esteban's going to be doing is trying to bring back the color and you can see he's experimenting with it right now. It's not visible to the naked eye but some of the dye is still extant. Using some of the color correction tools he can put the cyan back and get us a pretty good looking color version such that you would never be able to see for example with a projector. Fortunately, Esteban's pretty good at this at this point because he's been doing this for many years. Color coding by needle gauge of the cap and the sheath of the unit makes quick identification possible. This is exactly what I love to find in a collection is a lost moment in time. What I'm most proud of Periscope Film, it's that we have made all of this history available. 10,000 films, and again, we've probably collected another 10,000 we have not yet scanned. It all can be searched, and it's available for everybody to look at. That's something magical. This is the city that Vision built. We started putting up films like a decade ago, and what was unexpected and exciting and really, really cool sometimes was just the feedback loop that was created, the community that started to exist around our channel. I'll never forget that the first time somebody wrote a comment and said, my God, I just saw my father in your movie. It's an amazing thing to be able to provide the public. but you get the idea, right? And, and if anybody wants the smell of vision, they're welcome to come up here and you can give Mark Morris's uh, vinegar, vinegar films a, a good whiff. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, what happened is that after I, uh, Doug and I had collected a sort of critical mass of films and had started making them available on DVD and you know, I started getting approached by doc other documentary filmmakers because I'm in that world. And the people would say, where do I find, you know, this type of material or that type of material? And I started researching, uh, becoming a researcher for those people and um, locating content for them. And simultaneously, um, you know, we were able to start acquiring a lot of films, either through donations of, of films that would just be literally dropped off at our door, or uh, in some cases, I mean, a lot of the Navy films that we have, we literally dumpster dived to, to take them, you know, might get a phone call that, hey, by the way, uh, there's 500 films that have just been put in a dumpster. Um, you might want to go check, it, check that out. So, I mean, um, you know, with this latest very large collection that we acquired, we actually made a command decision that we couldn't even take care of. We couldn't even deal with the eight millimeter part of that. Um, so we, we actually got that to the Prelinger archive, which is another archive that's been doing this type of work for many years and held on to all the 16 millimeter material. And it's just, just to kind of catalog it and begin to try and protect it has been basically the last eight months. But we are sort of starting to have the luxury of going through some of it and, um, you know, there is gonna be some really interesting stuff discovered in there and we don't, you know, who knows what. Um, but 
uh, so we really started, you know, initially by saving some of these military films, but as you can see from what I just showed you, it turns out that there's a lot of content out there um, that is in need of protection, is in need of being saved. And, you know, what we realized at a certain point is that a lot of the military films that we had were, they were already held by National Archives. They were already available out there. So we started shifting our focus a little bit to try and save these industrial films and um, uh, films that were made, you know, maybe to advertise a product or a place or a company. And um, none of those films, or very few of them, ever ended up getting you know, sent to the Library of Congress or National Archives because these companies didn't view them as very important or, and, and they, they actually didn't, in many cases, didn't even copyright them because they wanted them to be kind of used. You know, they wanted them to be shown at club meetings or whatever, like Pan Am Airlines, which made absolutely gorgeous travelogue films of the entire planet. Um, you know, they didn't care about uh, how they were used as long as the Pan Am logo s stayed in the shot, right? So anyway, it just gives you a, a sense of, um, you know, the depth and breadth of what is out there. We tried to limit ourselves just to focus on nonfiction content because, you know, the Hal Roach movies and the, the silent comedies and all that stuff, those are actively being preserved by the film studios. And they're, you know, the film studios um, have, have uh, you know, they're, they're doing things on a much higher level than we would ever be able to do. So, um, you know, we don't try and compete with them. We just try to be, you know, a good complement to what they're doing. And, you know, the interesting thing in my world is I encourage everybody to try and, you know, if you, f if you find a film, like, like Mark did, he found this, this short driver's ed film from, I don't know, the 50s um, that, that was really kind of captivating. Um, you know, if you find a film, you can, that can be your film that you preserve, that you save, because there's a pretty good chance if it's, if it's a nonfiction film, if it's industrial, there may not be other copies of it that are out there. And now I'm gonna give you um, a, a fun example of something that we sort of stumbled across um, this, is a, this is a fragmentary little film. Uh, it's from a series that once we became aware that this series existed, we started like actively really trying to find films in this series. And I think we've preserved five of them so far. Before we scanned this and put this up on the internet, nobody seemed to know about this existing, this series of films. And we actually got contacted by um, people who were making documentaries who said, wow, I'm shocked to see this. I had no idea this existed. What the heck is this? And what it is, is uh, it's something called the All-American News. And it, it comes right out of World War II. And, uh, you know, you're a bunch of historians. So, you know, right before the war, there was enormous racial tension, and the country looked like it was on the verge of doing, maybe finally doing some of the reforms that ended up happening like a whole generation later. And since it was just Martin Luther King Day, I think you know what I'm talking about. But there, there was this moment in time when it looked like that, those reforms might happen, and then World War II broke out. And so there was, uh, there was a fear inside the country about, you know, would uh, the African American community go along with the war effort? And what had to be promised to them to get them to stick with it? And so you see like, you know, there's, there's some famous movies. There's one called The Negro Soldier that was made that was just to, to talk about, you know, sort of racial identity and issues to people in the army and to the public at large. And anyway, there was a series of films called All American News that were apparently made just to be shown in the black theaters because, you know, of course there used to be like, 
you know, there would be a theater for the whites and a theater for the blacks, and they would show, that's where the, you know, me show films would get shown. And so, you know, you might go to the, you know, the white theater and you would see all the newsreels that were out there, but this is what you might get to see if you went to one of the black theaters. and other technicians. The hospital is made of bamboo with a canvas roof, but all equipment is the most modern. A dentally equipped setup, this hospital is as fine as any in the United States. There's a large staff of trained nurses. There's every kind of medicine in this efficient pharmacy and a staff of experts. A laboratory technician is going to make a blood test. For our boys don't only suffer from wounds, many of them fall victims of tropical diseases. United States Signal Corps cameramen show technicians studying the blood specimen to identify microbes if any are present. A fluoroscope to detect lung and chest ailments. Actually, there is nothing that is lacking in this hospital in the craggy mountains of Burma. As the fight against Japan rages, the casualties are numerous. Casualties, too, in the course of the hard labor required to keep the Burma Road open, so surgeons are busy all the As long as friends and relatives can't come to call, doctors and nurses serve as visitors and cheer up the boys. You're going to be fit as a fiddle, says Doc. Daily exercises will make fingers fit as new. A Red Cross worker brings gifts. All this gives everyone a good idea of why funds are needed for the Red Cross and why blood plasma is needed. When we buy bonds and contribute to the Red Cross, we give new life to our sick or wounded men. The, the backstory on that particular segment is that uh, during the war, they were building this thing called the Lado Road in Burma, and uh, they sent over uh, African American construction battalions to do a lot of that work. And, um, you know, I have seen a ton of World War II era newsreels. And it's very rare to see an Afri one African American on screen in any of them. Maybe you'd see a truck driver. So, you know, the moment we saw, wow, there's surgeons. And, you know, it, it, it definitely, um, you know, called out that this is something important and it's uh, something that has to be looked at. And so, like I said, we subsequently have managed to find other episodes, complete episodes, of this particular program. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that uh, is especially gratifying. Uh, like, a lot of the people that watch our content on YouTube, we know are students. And so it's really, really important for, for students especially to be able to see this. Because, you know, especially if you're part of the minority community, you, you might think if you watched all that other content that there was no contribution other than the Tuskegee Airmen and the Red Ball Express. But to see this, it, you know, would definitely change your mind. Um, and that brings me to another one that's, we, this is something that's also kind of along the same lines, um, but it's something from the post-war era and we don't, this one is a little more of a mystery why this series of newsreels got made. Um, 
but I think it's really fun. And I, 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 my suspicion is, you know, during the war, women came into the workforce in a way that they had never been able to do. I mean, you know, my own um, great aunt was a, a, a welder in a shipyard. And I, I one time, you know, made like a Rosie the Riveter comment to her, and she got really offended and said, no, I was a welder. <laughs> <laughs> so, but again, there was this huge transition after the war, uh, you know, this questioning of like, would women go back to being housewives? You know, were they gonna go into the workforce? What was the new role for women in society? So this is another film that we found, and now we have found more films in this series, that again, it was, seems to have been completely sort of unknown, lost, um, made by some really obscure company that we found and resurrected, and now you can watch some of it. How do you do? Come with me to a monolith in Colorado. The castle rock that named a town. A town in which a woman upholds the prime principle of human freedom, the freedom of the press. The publisher of the record journal, Miss Marjorie E. Case. Weaned on Printer's Ink, now deft fingers at the keys, she sees copy through from pen to typewriter to linotype, tapping the keyboard faster than the machine can mold the metal letters translating news into type. Type to fit the forms. Then the galley proofs. and so to the printing press, all in capable transition from gathered news to newspaper. With her birth, she's 24, her father said, The record journal has needed a new printer, and she arrived today. We hope that someday she'll do the editing too. Perhaps from the newspaper man's Valhalla, he sees the record journal with a staff of one, Miss Marjorie Case. While in Colorado, a woman upholds a principle of freedom, in Yucaipa, California, Mrs. Nan Songer helped win a war to save that freedom. The webs of spiders provide her means. In the flowering yucca, named by Spanish conquistadores the candlesticks of God, she snares her weavers. Within her home, she breeds them. and children help in her supply. Looking on, all eyes, as she prepares to silk three specimens. For gun and navigation sites and precision instruments vital in war's destruction, but as vital in the constructive projects of peace, she silks spiders of their webs. Producing preferred webs, the golden garden and green lynx spiders with bites devoid of poison and with a bite of death, the venomous black widow. Her tools, a block of yucca wood, a small staple to hold them without injury, a dissecting needle, tweezers, and a small frame with lacquer at a corner to catch the web. Just tickle the spinnerets with the needle, and the spider gives of the fluid, which the air turns into web. Now you see how to silk a spider. Because no spider web is so coarse 
as five ten thousandths of an inch. To supply special needs, Mrs. Songer spins two or more together, or actually splits a web to five one hundred thousandths of an inch. In the far Pacific, her fighting son saw his target on cross sites from his mother's spiders. At home, his sister had to leave the wax to assist their mother in performance of a more important duty. But her preference runs to horses. As a whack, she rode for Camp Roberts in riding competitions. As Betty Willis, trick and fancy rider, she is known wherever rodeos are held. And as the saying is, there's a reason. The way she rides her Palomino is it. The Palomino is the golden horse of ancient fable. But then, no girl like Betty to ride one. Ride em, cowboy. <coughs> ride em, cowgirl. Goodbye now to Betty Willis, daring sportswoman, and her golden horse. Don't try those stunts at home, okay? It should have been a disclaimer. And be very careful when getting a web out of a spider for whatever purpose. <laughs> I mean, what's incredible about that, I had no idea until I watched this that they use spider webs for the recticles of anti-aircraft guns. Incredible. So this is the kind of stuff that we find and scan and put up on the web. And, you know, then things kind of get to take on a life of their own. And that's what's also really fun because, like, like I said in that piece, I mean, sometimes we've had people say, hey, my dad is in this film, or my mom is in this film, or my dad made this film. And um, <laughs> we've had that too. I mean, we've had, you know, uh, we just had a film that we scanned that um, uh, it turns out that um, it's a film about the city of Akron, Ohio, that it was made in 1915, and our print was probably made many years later because it's a 16 millimeter print, not 35. But it turns out this film was considered lost, and it was well known in the community of Akron. It was something they were really proud of. So I didn't know that, but I put it up on the web, and the next thing you know, um, it's in the uh, Akron newspaper, and we're gonna apparently have a screening of it out there in May. And it got like all the local historians interested and they figured out who's in it and where it was shot. And I mean, it's, it's impressive. So things can kind of take on a life of their own and that's, that's amazing. And the other thing that happens when you start doing what we're doing is you get people um, you know, like Mark who dropped by with his driver's ed film. You know, the one that happened recently was we got contacted by um, uh, a man whose father was in the Egyptian Air Force in the 50s, and uh, he was a pretty high-ranking doctor in the Air Force, and so he had shot home movies of uh, parades at the Air Force, and also his, his family's life in that era in, in Egypt, when Egypt was like on the rise, and um, uh, Nasser uh, took power, and you know, it looked like Egypt was headed for a whole new um, era as a superpower, and of course that didn't happen. But um, these movies are going to, you know, really provide insight for people in Egypt about that era. Because, uh, you know, I think it's fairly common for Americans, especially if they had means, to buy a 16 millimeter movie camera and shoot a lot of film. Not that many people in Egypt ever did that. So it's exciting, and I'm I'm kind of waiting, like what is, what is going to happen? What, what are people going to say about this when it gets published? Um, I could not come to the um, 
uh, Culver City Historical Society without bringing in something maybe of local interest. Um, we, we, um, I, I just wasn't able to get to it in time, but we do have a film, that a home movie, that briefly shows the MGM backlot, like right before a lot of, like it shows the, gone, the burned out shell of the Gone with the Wind house. Um, but you can go on YouTube and see that. This is something maybe a little more obscure, and I'm just going to let this play. But um, and of course, it's um, it's a silent home movie. But um, uh, this is this building in the background is something called the Pacific Military Academy, yeah. um, which was uh, well. See, you probably know a heck of a lot more about it than I do. This film is a little bit of a mystery. It seems like it was maybe shot as a test by someone. But it shows you know, the construction of some kind of World War II era barracks, um, which we suspect was part of the uh, first Army Motion Picture Unit. Uh, because it shows, this little film also shows some kind of trying to shoot bits and pieces of a training film. And so we all know that you know, Culver City's role during the war was to produce all these incredible training films and uh, instructional films and, and um, uh, you know, this may kind of show a tiny bit of that activity. Um, like a lot of home movies, it's, it's a little slow. So um, I'm just gonna whip to, there's a couple fun things here, like this, I love this, it's like this, you know, I don't know what that what that is exactly. It looks like you know some <coughs> giant demolished machine, but I guess it was for backdrop for you know combat training film. Well, that's great. You get the date here. As the date, there, there's actually a slate in here somewhere that identifies who shot this. Um, and there's like this is a little so, somebody could probably tell us like what this is obviously like a, a, a movie set of, of uh, European church or something. So there's, you know, the fun thing with home movies and the thing that's also really confounding about them is, um, you know, they can be shot in 10 different places in 11 minutes and you never know who shot them mostly and, and, and yeah, and why were they shooting it and what was going on. So, you know, like, um, you know, you just have to kind of, uh, hope that you get lucky and that there's a sign somewhere or there's something you can identify easily. Um, yeah, landmark. Um, like this part of this movie, I don't know if this was shot on the, um, the heights of um, Cheviot Hills or it maybe, maybe even on the, I don't know. I don't know where this is, but it's somewhere, it's somewhere local, I'm pretty sure. But this is just a bunch of these guys going out on a on a march and uh, slogging away and trying to trying to make it look like they're in Italy, <laughs> you know, for their combat training film. Yeah, I mean, this is all part of the same film. Oh, there was a slate. So see, this is just I, I couldn't say particular with this film, but a lot of times what happens is we'll buy a collection of films. Yeah. This might be in there. We might buy films from eBay. We might buy them. We might get them from Craigslist. We might have a collector sell them to us. Um, all sorts of things like that happen. And anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it open to Q&A, but um, I wanted to leave it with a, this is a film we just scanned uh, yesterday. So I haven't even watched it, but um, I thought it would be fun to watch a, a couple minutes of it because it's kind of a glorious, you know, there was an era when there was a thing called, you know, Kodachrome, and there was a thing called Technicolor. These were film stocks that were just so gorgeous and some of them were only made or produced for a very short time and um, so anyway, it's delightful to, to see these things and anyway, um, what I would encourage you to do while watching this is if you, if you see something fun, just yell it out. You know, because there's, there's some fun stuff in here. This is some kind of training film. This is actually from a whole series of films. We got a, a phone call from a man who's in his 80s. He said, 
Um, I worked for the Sinclair Oil Corporation. You know, the one with the dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly there's all these Sinclair stations in LA that there's, they suddenly reappeared. I don't quite understand. But anyway, he said, I worked for them. I have a barn that has, you know, a hundred films that they made. And um, would you be interested in any of them? Because I don't know, you know, no one in my family wants them. So of course I'm interested <laughs> because <laughs> anything to do with the oil industry is always fascinating, but especially like watching this. And again, I know there are people who are under the age of 30, so you might not know what this means, but there was a thing called full service. <laughs> Is important if you a convenient station, location. That's one reason many car owners give for selecting a particular service station. That's a pretty good reason. To most of us, convenience means a station nearby, close to our home or to our work. For example, if a good Sinclair station is located, say, up about here, the dealer would normally expect that his station would be the most convenient for those who live or work in this area. But let's always remember one thing. Our best gasoline customers are the ones who are on the move a lot. And for people on the move, a convenient station is not always the best station. Take the Adams family, for instance, who live just a couple of blocks from this station. There's Mr. Adams, just about to leave for work. Who knows what car that he does is. this every day, five days a week, and just about the same time. Hmm, seven o'clock, he leaves pretty early. This morning, and at least twice a week, he needs gas. He's got to stop someplace. Now, this here's music. the station nearest to his home. It's close, all right, but it's closed. Mr. Adams passes it up. How many gas stations have you gone to recently that are closed? <laughs> there are many stations along his way. He'll have to pick one. Hmm, a busy corner. This ought to be convenient for him, right on his way. But it's not for Mr. Adams. One reason some drivers choose a station is that they prefer a certain brand. Why? What makes drivers rate one company's product higher than another's? So it's time again to think about your engine. Driving today? Drive with care and use Sinclair Power X gasoline. One big answer is advertising. National advertising means telling more people about Sinclair in as many places as possible. Have you noticed the Sinclair National Park ads, Marge? They're interesting. This one's all about Washington's home at Mount Vernon. Maybe we should take that in on our next trip. I think I'll give one of their stations a try for gas, too. There are other ways of getting car owners interested in a certain brand. Here's one of the best, word of mouth advertising. It's the truth, Pete. I actually get better performance. You don't say. Yeah, Sinclair's high test power X, they call it. You ought to try it. A satisfied customer tells a friend. Whether this way or signs right at the station or national advertising, Millions of drivers are persuaded daily to try the Sinclair brand. And when it's brand that makes them pick a station, this emblem clearly shows them where to get it. At least, it should. All right.
right, I think you guys get the point. And how many of you are gonna go out and get some Sinclair gas now? It's the closest station, it's not very convenient, but it's down Venice, La Cienega. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure, but we have a lot of films with the dinosaur in it. And um, one of the ones that we scanned recently, like last week, was uh, the opening of one of these stores in Chicago, one of these Sinclair service stations. And they had the dinosaurs all, all over the store, like in these inflatable you know, rubber dinosaurs. And that film is actually really interesting because it was in an African-American community. Um, so they actually had like a jazz band and they, you know, they really tried to make it like accessible and like, you know, uh, yeah, they, they really tried to do it up. And so that was also very interesting because every one of these training films and soliciting films is Lily White. I mean, that's one of the things you get, uh, you know, you get a, can get a really good sense of, especially when you watch like some, uh, we have a, um, uh, a bunch of railroad films made by railroads that were in, they were in the South, and you won't see an African American in the films at all, except maybe as the porters or the waiters, you know, in the trains. And that's, that's really, it, it's a statement about that era, but it's kind of what we're stuck with. And um, anyway, I want to throw it open to some questions, if there are some. Yes, in the I back. Wait, hold your questions until we get a microphone oh, to you. Okay, we're gonna get the microphone over there. I was trying to. I was trying to figure out who is the audience for this because it's just explaining. You know, it's not like persuading someone. To me, is that supposed to persuade someone to go to Sinclair? Well, I, I think, I think what I mean, this maybe film is it's about. it's 80 years later and it's different, but it's, I, it's, I couldn't understand it's made, that. It's made for someone that probably owns a station to, oh, okay. to get them to understand, number one, like, what am I paying all this money to the Sinclair oh, okay, Corporation okay. to have this franchise? Right. Oh, it's because they're spending money, they're spending that money on national advertising. And, 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 and it's also trying to encourage those dealers, like, have have more hours, you know. Okay. Stay so open that, longer. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Because I was thinking it's. I mean, it's not for the consumer. No. no. Yeah. Okay. And that and that's actually one of the things that's a, kind of astonishing. If you know, if you come out of my world, and you see the amount of money that they spent making this film, that would have been around for a couple of years, compared to like an, some of the educational films which are used in classrooms. I mean, it probably costs ten times as much. You know, it's a beautiful color print, and you know, it's shot all over the place, and all these graphics. You know, anyway. Just a pleasing voice. Yes, yes. Uh, in the in the front here. Oh. There we go. Is that on? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Thanks very much. Great information. Uh, two questions, really. Uh, Curious, you talked about preserving the films. You've talked about putting them up on YouTube. Are you keeping digital copies for yourself? And if so, how are you storing those? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we do, you saw our film scanner in the short that I showed. And so that machine actually makes a um, high definition one-to-one -one version of the film um, in HD and also in 4K resolution. And so all of that data is stored on hard drives. And then it's also backed up onto um, tape arrays. And so there's, there ends up being three copies. There's a film, and then there's this digital version. And um, you know the films, like some, some films end up like this. And we've had, we've actually, I, we just had a cull, probably about 50 films out of our collection that had gone they had just deteriorated in the time we've owned them. But fortunately, we had scanned all of them. And then there are films that you know, are 100 years old, and they're absolutely fine, and we expect them to last even longer, and we would love to keep them around as long as possible. Um, you know, I mean, the funny thing about having digital content is digital is also, you know, as much as we like to think it's not, you know, it's here forever, it, it, it hard drives fail, and so, 
I'm very lucky because Doug, my business partner, really understands the data side of things and is very adept at making sure everything is backed up properly and everything is, um, you know, taken care of. Because we actually, we, we realized at a certain point that our small business is actually using the kind of storage that you would actually expect like a, a very large company to be using, like a $50 million company might be using the same amount of data storage space that we're using for our tiny little business. Yeah, yeah. disk drives fail, digital stuff goes bad. That's a huge amount of storage. That's a lot of hard drives. Yeah. Um, it, the other question I had is that companies, certainly in the past, used to do a lot of uh, uh, promotional shows for salespeople and in-house people and that sort of thing. I know there's a, a huge market out there for like recordings of those things. You know, there are people that collect LPs of those shows. Just wondered if you've run across any video of shows like that or have any of that in your archives. Um, there actually is a documentary film, which I cannot remember the name of off the top of my head, but it's specifically about the people that made the kind of films you're talking about. So you might want to look into that. Is it I, Backflip Over Broadway? Yeah, that yeah uh, maybe. That might be a, do you know it, Hope? No, I have a question. Ah, okay. Well, anyway, but uh, we don't really, we don't really have those in our collections. Those are, the thing is, like, those specific films, they were most likely made to be shown at, like, one dealer meeting. And so there might only be one or two copies of those films that existed. And so, yeah, they're beyond rare. Thank you, Nick, for a really great uh, presentation tonight. I was in awe of my conversation with you because there are some clips that you had in your very beginning that we actually used as research for 13 days, a story about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so <coughs> your work in my end of Hollywood was really important. But my friend here, John, he used to work at the MGM Film Lab. And I remember when I was working at MGM, they used to take all the film from the lab and they'd put them in big trucks and they'd run it to Tennessee or someplace down to some mines where the temperature stays the same. And I'm just curious because we have things here. We have those newspapers I showed you tonight, the microfilm. Are you taking that type of, are you putting your, your films into a, 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 a temperature controlled, constant? H how do you preserve in LA? Because we have, Mark knows we have film, we have those newspapers on microfilm. They're starting to smell and decay. My parents probably still have home movies in the garage. What, what do we do with, um, where would you suggest storing? I mean, you know, what I tell Once people... Once you digitize I, things, you, you can't just put it in a closet because the temperature no. changes all the time, right? Is that... Yeah, I mean, I tell people this all... I mean, a great example is uh, uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary, which came out a couple of years ago that was fabulous. Um, if you watched it, you saw that uh, there were these wonderful home movies of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her husband, but they, were, they looked terrible. And it was because they had transferred them to VHS, and when they did that, they threw away the original films. And yeah, and so you know, I always tell people, you know, if you have these kind of things, if you have your grandparents' photographs, if you have their films, you know, take care of them. Try to try to keep them stored. And just because you made a copy of something doesn't mean that you should ever get rid of the original. You should keep it around because. Like I said, digital can sometimes fail. I mean, it, it can. And so, you know, having the original film is the ultimate backup. And it's even, I was telling you actually, I was saying to Hope earlier today, because they had, um, they, they, we're looking at microfiche. And one of the great kind of sad things that happened with microfiche was they would scan a newspaper with taking pictures of it with a camera in black and white. and Sometimes the person doing that was like a university student who didn't get enough sleep and was out of focus or the contrast was wrong or whatever. And so that piece of microfiche is bad. 
and it didn't preserve any of the color content that was in those newspapers, and it, it looks terrible. And so, like, the Culver City Historical Society has some actual real newspapers that, you know, those are really kind of valuable. You know, it's worth trying to deacidify them and preserve them and keep them because they're going to be so much better than the microfiche ever was. Well, I like your suggestion where to go with that, too. Thank anyway. you for that. Yes. Um, it was a great presentation. And since you didn't monetize this, where do you get your backing and your money? Oh, well, actually, we do monetize it. That's, yes, that's the secret sauce. So, <laughs> so yeah, we would never be able to do this yeah. without being, uh, you know, having silver spoons in our mouth or whatever. No, what happened is, like I said, at a certain point I realized I was getting hired by documentary filmmakers to help them make their movies. And so what we started to do was license footage from our collections to filmmakers. And that business has grown and grown and grown. And so we you know, are constantly working with uh, documentary filmmakers, the History Channel, Discovery, PBS, um, the BBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Service, uh, channels in Europe, art. Um, so we're, we're supplying them with um, footage. And, and so, you know, they come to us looking for things. They'll send me these long lists of all the content they're trying to find. Um, and sometimes those lists are really, really funny because they'll say, like, do you have a, like an alternate angle on the Zapruder film? Uh, you know, do you have footage of the aliens at Area 51? And I, and I just know, you know, sometimes it's a, you know, uh, you know, there's some 17-year-old intern. I shouldn't say that because I think there's a 17-year-old intern here. But anyway, oh yeah, she's left. Okay, so yeah. Um, but anyway, that, so that's how we managed to do this. So what we, what we do is we license clips to them to tell their stories. And um, it's like the new Errol Morris movie that's coming out. And I, I probably can't even say this, because I, but I didn't sign an NDA. But there's a lot of our content that's in that movie. Uh, but isn't it online as well, or you don't put everything online? Well, we have a backlog of, I mean, we have an entire storage locker of film we haven't scanned yet. And we'll, ne we'll never catch up, I don't think, to what we have because uh, the way it's worked out is it keeps, we keep having more fall into our laps, whether we want it to or not. And um, so that's kind of a, a bit of a curse. So what we try and do at this point is sort of look at, I mean, one of my roles in the business is to try and look at what we have on the shelf and what we've already scanned and try to you know, locate things that we haven't seen before, and, and so that's what we do. Nick, describe the square footage of your storage facility. I mean, it's pretty big. I, I don't want to get into specifics, but, <laughs> but it's a lot. You know, it's, it, it costs a lot of money in Los Angeles to store anything. And um, it's actually, you know, one of the reasons that, I mean, unfortunately, we can't preserve more because there's just finite limits to the amount of space that we have. And um, that's why I, I get contacted by people all the time who sort of want to do what we're doing or are kind of doing what we're doing on a smaller scale. And I, I try to encourage them to do it because there's way too much material out there that's at risk. And um, there's just not enough people who care about it. And, um, you know, there, there are some really interesting things. Like, there's, there's a, um, uh, an event every year that's uh, worldwide, actually, at this point, called Home Movie Day, which you may or may not have heard of. But it's, um, you know, the Motion Picture Academy has actually been involved in it in recent years here in Los Angeles. And just people are, are um, told, like, bring your family's home movies, and there will be knowledgeable people there who will look at them, they'll fix the splices, they'll make them ready to be kind of projected, and then they'll be able to show them. They, they actually show them in a theater, and everybody kind of gets to watch them. 
And, but, so there's more and more awareness every day of the fact that these things are endangered. And, you know, unfortunately, we'll never know what was already lost. You know, and it was, it was heartbreaking when we, you know, we rescued this huge collection. I mean, the fellow who had that collection hadn't really been able to properly manage it for years. And they had already thrown away a, a lot of film that, you know, who knows what it was. I mean, we, we opened a can that said it was, it had this long description of what was on the film. It was someone who was in the life, um, lifeguard service which was like the, the, the organization that took care of lighthouses. And, they, and it, it was a very detailed account of all this stuff that had been filmed by this lifeguard service. It sounded fabulous, but the film was a complete loss. You know? And that's just, that happens. I know that the LA Central Library has a pretty active home movies uh, effort to uh, preserve or collect that's great. Yeah. Got another question right here. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. I was a aerospace photographer for 20 years. And back in the day, because the company was basically around since 1940 at LAX, Garrett Air Research was the name of the company. And they had film unit within the photo department. So lots of films. Now I came in in 77 and I was starting to go to videotape, so that's where I got went with that. But when we all were getting laid off in 99, uh, there was a bunch of films in a, in a storage area. And being a fan of film, I grabbed everything I could. So I have everything. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that's the dilemma. That's the dilemma. So actually, though, that might, I, you might be the... Please come see me. Come see me after class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but the other side of it is that, yeah, they, uh, uh, the, the cinematographer that was, uh, became the boss of our department, he, wasn't, he was still facilitating film editing and, and, and shooting just for a little while. So I saw the storage containers of the raw film, the, uh, the originals, and they went to uh, Iron Mountain. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if they're still there. So now, what happens in the sense of a company who might or might not have those, that footage? Sports? Yeah, well, I, I know exactly what happens to a lot of it because, for instance, when Boeing went to make a big retrospective history of their company, they actually came to us for footage because they you know, had thrown away so much. Because these companies, I mean, a great example, you know, is like um, uh, Rockwell. They, you know, they got bought by, uh, I don't even remember, Northrop or, you know, and they, they just, you know, once there's a, a big change in the corporate culture, nobody cares about <laughs> what the company did or what it was. I mean, and so there's just, there tends to be, um, you know, a throwing away of a lot of things. The aerospace industry side of it is what I, my and, interest is, yeah. And by the way, I was talking about all those films that at Point Magoo, including the ones that were classified. I was told, and I don't know if it's completely true, but I was told by somebody pretty knowledgeable that those films that I saw where they said, oh, that's classified, all that footage, they see it's, it's really time consuming to declassify things. And so if somebody walked into a room and said, well, I don't know what content in here is classified and what isn't, we know that there was a film in here that showed a simulated nuclear warhead and that's definitely classified. All that stuff went, it all got destroyed, okay? So it just gives you an idea of uh, you know, how much content can just vanish in a blink of an eye. Time for one more question. Oh, me. <laughs> Is the mic on? I was just going to mention, I worked at uh, NBC in New York. And uh, in 1962, I had a bunch of friends that were editing on the fifth floor and said to them, oh, how come we don't show a mall and the night visitors anymore at Christmas time? 
And they looked at me and said, oh, we really can't talk about it. And I said, well, oh. is it ever going to get shown again? And they took me aside. Uh, I was working at the time for the vice president of the radio network, not TV. And they said, if we told you how many things got copied over, the masters were just used as leftover film, and they copied over all kinds of unimportant things, and they're lost forever. Yeah. So maybe someday you'll come upon that. <laughs> it was a marvelous show. I don't know if anybody could have copied it I off think, of TV. I think that's out there in the world. I want to say I've seen that. But the, you're, what you're saying is, the original is from the 50s. a lot of videotape. I mean, the most famous instance is, yep. and I get this email at least once a year from oh. somebody who's very hopeful, that is that this cult TV show, Doctor Who, Yes. That BBC did not, the videotapes were super expensive and they didn't see any reason that they were ever going to rerun anything. So they just reused the videotapes. Yep. And they so they, there's like entire years of Doctor Who that don't exist, except that a few episodes got to Australia. They were shipped down there and nobody ever bothered to send them back. So they, so. But I every now and then I'll get an email, hey, um, you know, did you ever find a missing Doctor Who episode? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, they were very anyway. cavalier about the whole thing. Yeah. Just anyway, I really appreciate everybody coming tonight, and thank you for being a great audience.